little girl strip survivors morph, barbershop, the next cut, and a tons of amazing <laughs> reality <laughs> exciting projects that she's coming that are coming up. We obviously first got um, her attention, or Hollywood got her attention first when she created the web series Misadventures of Awkward Black Girl. Mm -hmm. And in, in amazingly just a few short years, she obviously skyrocketed to success with scripts that portray comedic, insightful, and hilariously real characters that resonate with audiences, black, white, male, female, young, old, everyone. Without further ado, Tracy Oliver. to some audience questions. So get those ready. Anyway, hello. Hello. So your success has been very quick. Um, I know you've been working for a long time. Not to me, but sure. I can see how people think that, for sure. <laughs> how has, given your history making with Girls Trip, how have the last couple of years been? It's been like night and day, honestly. I remember literally, I think it was 2011, Issa and I took a meeting at five or six networks when Awkward Black Girl was blowing up, and people were like, this is cute, but black girls can't be on TV. <laughs> this is literally what people were saying to us. Was that eight years ago? So to put it in perspective, it's been a complete 180 since then, but those eight years have felt very long to me, but I can see how, you know, for people looking at, I guess, the progress that we've made, it seems really quick and simple, but, whew, it's been a long journey for us, yeah. So, let's just talk about Little, very mm -hmm. quickly. Um, congratulations. Thank you. So, it's funny to me how you were pitched by, what was she, 10 years old then? Yes. <laughs> stupid and crazy and awesome. Um, what was it about her idea about kind of flipping the script of Big that enticed you? Well, first of all, Marseille is scary. So <laughs> whenever she asks you to do anything, you just do it. She wouldn't take no for an answer anyway. So I was like, I guess I'm writing this movie for you. And I literally had to, I, Big, let me start back with Big. I love that movie. Tom Hanks is a G. That whole movie is amazing. It's a little weird when Tom Hanks has sex with a woman. That's the only part of it in watching it today that doesn't quite hold up. But other than that, it's an amazing perfection of a movie. And I think it's like just a breakout for Tom Hanks. And anyway, so I had to like big up the movie because it's perfection. But um, other than that weird scene, I <laughs> loved it thought that it could, you know, have a remake or something with it, and sat down with Marseille. She was 10, I was not 10, and she actually had a lot of notes for me and joke wow. pitches and things to, to put in the movie. So a lot of it, like the spanking scene and, all, and just random jokes that we went into Universal and did in the actual pitch are still in the movie. So a lot of this really was, is it an echo? Do you guys hear that too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was really bothering me, but I didn't know if anybody else could hear it. Um, yes, yeah, so we went into Universal. She was 10. I was nervous. I think I was sweaty, and she was telling me to get my shit together. <laughs> and <laughs> we pitched it, and they bought it in the room. And from there, I just had to sit down and try to write it. But I will say, little is harder than big to make the premise work because when you're an adult, you know childhood sucks. So you don't want to go back to it. Whereas with, with Big, you kind of get you know how a, a child would want to become an adult. So it was a tricky thing to reverse, but we kept working on it back and forth and trying to figure out a way into it that made sense. And coming off of Girls Trip, Mm -hmm. which I watch on repeat on HBO, by the way. Whatever. <laughs> um, very raw. 
raunchy, amazingly raunchy. Now switching over to little, I'd imagine there's a little bit of a censoring that has to go on. Oh yeah, that was weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the timing of it was actually really problematic for me because I was finishing up Girl Strip at the same time as starting Little. So the first draft I turned into the studio, they were like, you do know she's a child, right? Mm. <laughs> so the, a lot of the stuff that I thought was appropriate for um, a kid, it turns out you can't do. So <laughs> you can't have sex scenes, you can't have cursing, you can't smoke weed. I give you a whole list of things that kids can't do on screen. So that was fun. Well, just watching Marseille and her teacher, the, just the looks that that little girl gives are scary. She's great, but it's scarily good. Oh, she's amazing. The thing about Marseille, I'm actually convinced she is 35. Right. <laughs> I don't think she's a child. I, she literally like will school you when you talk to her. And she'll check you when you're wrong. It's just, it's really weird, but that's kind of why her performance was seamless to me, because I think she is a grown woman in a child's body. So, yeah, it was fun. And then, so you also got to collaborate with your college friend, Lisa mm -hmm. Ray. How was that working with her, and how did you kind of reconnect with her to make it happen? Yeah, that's always weird and surreal, right? Like, um, I met Issa in a drama class at Stanford. We were always the two black people um, <laughs> being considered for the one spot in the play or the musical. And we literally became friends off of that because we were competitors. And then all of a sudden it was like, why don't we team up and figure out how we cannot be competitors? And that's where All Her Black Girl came from and just, even at Stanford, we used to put on plays and musicals all the time. But when I think about, you know, back in whenever that was, 2004, <laughs> um, it's kind of surreal to think about this random person that I met in drama class. I'm now sitting in the art clay, and I wrote something that she's in. So it, it's, it's crazy how life works. I never knew that our meeting would be that long of a relationship. And, and it just, a professional, um, I guess, crossing a pass because we didn't plan it. Little wasn't written for Issa. It was written for Marseille, and I had no idea that she was going to be in it initially. Oh. So you didn't reach out or had someone already cast her in that role? No. So the random part was in the first draft, Regina Hall was supposed to play Issa's part. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> she was attached to play April. And then as development goes, things change over time. And then eventually it became, what if Regina is the older version of Marseille? And who do we get to play April? And then in comes Isa. And obviously I'm like, of course that makes sense. Um, but that wasn't the initial formation. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. Um, so going back to Awkward Black Girl, mm -hmm. you had said, that the reason why it was created, like you said, is because you guys were pitted against each other and there were no black female roles, or very few of mm -hmm. those roles. So you decided, let me change the script, let me change the problem, and just make my own damn content, which to me is a really, really scary and a super ballsy thing to do. Did you know back then that you were being ballsy or were you just doing kind of a, out of necessity? We knew we were being ballsy because we couldn't pay our bills. <laughs> so that <laughs> let us know right away that this was a risky endeavor. Both of our parents um, are in the medical profession. That's some, another weird thing we had in common. Her dad is a doctor, my dad is a doctor, and they both were like, what the hell are you guys doing? Hmm. You went to Stanford so you could make a web series. <laughs> so they were very disappointed. I'm not, <laughs> not going to lie, they were not happy about this because we were literally on unemployment and just doing $20 craft services and hustling. I, I went to USC for grad school and 
literally how we got the equipment for it was I checked it out of USC under the guise of we're doing something for class and then shot the show and then returned it on Monday. Sorry, USC, that's what I did. <laughs> well, you were being resourceful. That's my Yeah, I was producing and I was trying to figure out how do we get it shot and made without spending any money, which we didn't have. And at that point, which still kind of shocks me, this was pre-blackish, pre-insecure, <coughs> pre-scandal, pre-how to get away with murder, pre-Atlanta. There were no black people <laughs> on TV, especially in the comedic space. So when we were telling people we had this idea, no one wanted to listen to it, and we knew there was an audience. So we just said, we're gonna make it ourselves, and we put it out there, and the, the response was overwhelming. I mean, I couldn't believe, I think within three weeks, we had hit 10 million, and that was also before the, you know, the boom of all the web series and digital content, so we were really ahead of our time. And then just mainstream people started reaching out to us. Thanks. And so fast forward, how many years ago was that? That was 2011. Okay. Yeah. So what is this? 20 fast forward eight, eight, eight years. years. <laughs> yeah. Here's my math. Um, and now you're one of you're joining a really awesome class of black female and male content creators. I mean, how does that feel? Again, really surreal. It's it's not something that I take for granted. It's something that I'm really grateful for. I'm from South Carolina. Nobody in my family lives on the West Coast. I have no connections to the industry. I didn't know it was even possible. So I'm one of those people that just decided to do it. And I'm a Gemini, so I'm a little crazy, but I just decided to just go out there and try to make it happen for myself. So I'm still kind of pinching myself every now and then that I get to see these types of movies on screen. I think with Girls Trip in particular, I am the black girl that always is drunk and partying. <laughs> but I didn't think that I could get away with doing that type of movie. I really didn't. I was like, oh, white girls get to have fun like that on screen, but not us. And when I was approached um, by Will Packer with maybe you can take a stab at this, I was like, oh, this is my life. This is my dream. I, I dream of writing great fruit scenes and um, showing black women in awful ways on screen. And I just really loved it, and, and with Little as well. Like, it's a big deal to have a movie get released nationwide with three black women in the lead yeah. role. Like, it's, I, I literally remember when people would say, no one will watch those things. And when Girl Strip hit 100 million domestic, it felt really good. <laughs> yeah, I think you proved them a little wrong. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. <laughs> so you, I know that you said you love writing characters that you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that you write them really well, where they're real, they're funny, they're endearing. When you're writing a character, are there certain qualities that you're making sure that they embody or that the audience kind of picks up on, if that makes sense? Yeah. Um, what I try to do, and this sounds very weird, but <laughs> I try to make sure that the characters feel specific and universal at the same time. And what I mean by that is I don't shy away from really black moments. Like if there's something that I feel like is gonna speak to a certain audience, I lean into that. But at the same time, I don't feel like leaning into those things makes it too specific for someone who's not a black woman to enjoy. I mean, I love, a lot of different types of movies and art. And I've always wondered why I can love things and art from people that don't belong to a culture that I belong to, but we can't have the same thing in reverse. So what I try to do is, is be authentic and be specific um, about my life and my experiences. Don't be ashamed of it. Um, I thought Girl Struck 
and little and, and moments are <laughs> very black um, and it's very much how we as black women relate to each other behind closed doors um, but there's also something very universal about it I hope um, where you don't have to be like me to, to like it and you mentioned earlier that was it the studio who came to you and said no one's gonna watch that movie do you still kind of experience that you've obviously proven that you can write amazing scripts that are amazingly successful with a female black-led cast but do you still have studios saying nah or do you still have to kind of prove yourself I will say it's easier in 2019 than it was in 2011 for sure but every single time that we have a successful movie people find a way to make it be the exception and not the rule mm -hmm. so they'll say oh well yeah well girl strip was different you know that was a party movie or this was i've even had people say um when i was pitching a horror movie well do black people like horror movies? <laughs> and then Get Out happened. And I'm like, yeah, they do. <laughs> they like a lot. Um, and, and not only that, but what Jordan Peele proved was that it's not just an audience of black people that will show up. I mean, to get the numbers that he had for us, that's not black people. That's everybody. And that means, again, we're more universal than people allow us to be. And I think every time that we have one of these movies, I hope that it completely changes people's, I guess, reactions and their thought processes, but it's not always the case. Sure. Um, I kind of want to change topics a little bit. So I read a great article um, from Entertainment Weekly last week where you told them that as a writer, you are now demanding, I hate the word demanding, but I guess standing up aggressively, <laughs> asking aggressively for what you want. And because of that, you now have an executive producer credit. Why is that important to you? And do you hope that more writers will follow suit? Absolutely. I, if I can be really, really candid, I don't think the industry values writers enough. I think that's why I really don't, especially in the film world. I think in TV, because, you know, TV is definitely a writer's medium, but in the film world, it's very much a director and a producer's medium. But you have nothing until you have a script. And what ends up happening is that a writer, and I don't know how many writers are here, but you guys know how horrible it is to write. <laughs> it is migraine inducing, um, anxiety inducing, it is just, I mean, unless you guys love it, but I, maybe I'm alone. I think it's really, really hard to do, and it's really hard to do well, and you're doing draft after draft, and notes, and tracking, and setting up, you know, and paying off things, and it's, it's like putting together um, a really elaborate puzzle and what my experience has been is I go off to script the actors are usually not attached at this point the director may or may not be attached but nobody's really in the trenches with you when you're looking at that blank screen and creating a world from scratch and then what ends up happening is you turn in the script and then everybody eats off the success of it except for you mm. the actors do the director does the producer does and i learned from girl strip um because that was a totally original idea they literally said to me black women essence best go and i had to build a world and come up with everything and then success of that movie i didn't have any back then and because the studio didn't think the movie was going to be profitable, I accepted a really low fee to write it. Mm. And so, had you had a producer credit, you would have gotten stuff on the back end. Oh, for sure. That's 
stupid. <laughs> yeah. And great. Yeah, it's crazy. It's it's crazy. And, but that was a life lesson that I needed to learn. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. A lot of people don't know that writers don't participate in the back end really, and you have to be a producer or a director to be mm -hmm. able to do that. Mm -hmm. And so are there, I'm assuming, there are other writers who ask for the executive producer credit because of that, but it's just not a normal thing to do, I guess? Yeah, it's, it's not normal, and studios kind of fight you on it because they, they try to put you in a box of, well, you're just the writer. And mm -hmm. my problem with that is, once again, if I don't, create the IP, you have nothing to shoot. The actors don't have lines, the director has nothing to, to film. Everyone can't do their job until I do mine. And my argument isn't that writers should be making more than everybody, but mm -hmm. we should be sharing with everybody in the process. Mm -hmm. so, so now that you do have an executive and an executive producer credit or title, how has that now changed your involvement in the production? Well, I still have more work <laughs> to do, but what I like about it is that now I have more incentive, honestly, to be really invested in it. Before, I was invested just because I liked the, pro the process of creating, but um, it doesn't feel good when everybody is able to profit off something that you've created that you're not sharing in. And also, um, when you hand off a script as a writer to a director, you kind of relinquish control. And I, I had a hard time with that, that too. Yeah, so at least, I mean, anything that anyone does, it, it, it's your baby. Yes. You would want to at least see it through or have some sort of say so you don't give it up completely. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of, cold and brutal how it happens. It, it literally is like you nurse a, a child, you know, from birth to like however long the script took. And then they're like, okay, thank you for your services. And then that's it. And then they take the script and act like you didn't do all of that with the script. Mm. And that's kind of hard because you want to stay on and participate. So for me, the producing aspect is not just financial. I want to be able to weigh in on casting. I want to show up on set and see they like, come to life. I, I hate being ripped, you know, away from the creative process when it gets into production. Have you so any of the projects that you have coming up? Are you now involved in casting, or has it not gotten to that point yet? Um, the projects that I have that I'm currently working on, yes, that haven't come out yet. That's a requirement at this point. Oh, good for you. I That's just great. decided that if you want me to write, then you have to let me stay on for the creative process and in production. And some people have said no. And some people have been like, okay, I'll let you do that. But it's still a fight. Writers are not accustomed in, in the movie space to staying on throughout production. Well, I think it's a really similar concept of just knowing what your worth is in terms of pay. Mm -hmm. Also, I mean, we all know that's a massive problem for women in the industry. And me personally, I'm scared of giving my rate and it being too high because they may not hire me and they may say no, but it's just a matter of knowing what the freak you're worth, mm -hmm. standing up for it, and they better say yes. Yeah, 100%. And I think as women, we're extra scared of making the ask. And then I think as a woman of color, I'm extra, extra scared of making the ask. But I finally decided that I needed to bet on myself. And if someone didn't see my value, then I guess we weren't meant to work together. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a project that I was really, really passionate about, and I did ask for some type of producer credit, and the studio said no. And I immediately panicked. <laughs> and I called my team, because I, you know, decided to act all big and bad, and I'm like, if they're not gonna give me what I want, I'm walking. And they were like, walk. And then I was like, oh shit. Yeah, and then I was like, oh no. I put that all wrong. <laughs> and 
I called my team and I'm, I was literally in tears because I was like, I didn't expect for them to play it like that. And then I held firm, they held firm, and guess what happened? A week later, they called back. But I didn't go back to them. They, they ended up holding before I did. Awesome, I love that. Congrats. Thank you. <laughs> um, switching gears again. So you've said that growing up, you didn't have shows or writers or directors of color to kind of look up to because you just didn't know if they existed at the time. I'm sure they did, but no. Yeah. So mentorship is a big thing for you. Um, why is that important to you? Oh, for so many reasons. Um, I think the beginning of my career would have been so much easier if I had someone guide me through it. And not only did I not know that many writers of color, especially in the movie world, to reach out to, but um, there weren't a lot of people actually offering to do it, which I was kind of disappointing. I think it was a more competitive time. I do actually think there's more opportunities now than ever because of streaming and all the different buyers that are out there. But um, just 10 years ago, I just felt like it was very competitive, very like everybody gets like, you know, their own project and they're not really looking out um, to bring up the next generation. So coming out of film school, there really just weren't any internships or fellowships or people setting just things up for you to do. And so I had to navigate it by myself. And I learned a lot of tough lessons by myself. And now I feel like I have a responsibility to reach back out to people and mentor. And um, one of the projects that I'm doing that on is with Clueless, and um, so excited for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of fun, but I'm doing a, a new, it's just Clueless in the title, it's not literally the exact same movie, because that movie's perfection as well, but, um, and I did have time to write it, but it was really important for me to usher someone new into the system. So I reached back out to um, a really talented young black writer um, who writes for Glow, and he's Marquita. And I was like, do you want to write Clueless? <laughs> and she was really excited by the opportunity and decided to, to do it. And I wish that someone had called me <laughs> and said, hey, do you want to do this thing? And not only is it important for me to bring someone else into the studio system, but I'm also mentoring her throughout the process that's the second part of mentorship. You can't just bring somebody in, you have to help, yeah, guide and nurture and, and navigate the whole thing with them. It's a, it's a whole process. And it's hard, but it's worth it. Well, and it's kind of, it stinks because oftentimes women in the industry get a bad rap because we all want our projects to go to the top. We want to see the success. Um, and sometimes it seems as though we are cutthroat. Mm -hmm. And I do think that there's a shift now of women actually embracing other women's success. It's like, what's the point of us going up against each other when mm -hmm. we all want to be just as successful and just help each other? Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're doing that, you know, is awesome. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> It's short-sighted to not support each other because, I mean, even from a, like, to not make myself look like a saint, even from a financial point of view, if I can't do the job, right, then it makes sense to step aside and nurture someone, and that way we both win, mm -hmm. honestly, because I, I get to produce, I love being on set, I love developing material, and then someone who otherwise wouldn't have gotten a shot now gets a chance to do it. So we're not competitive. It's a great, you know, uh, is it symbiotic relationship? I'm messing up my words. But um, I feel like we both win in that scenario. And I wish more people had the mentality that we can both thrive. We don't have to, it doesn't have to be either or. It can be both of us. And I think you are becoming not the exception. But oh, there yeah. still are some out there, but I hope that we're gravitating more toward that thinking. 
Um, okay, I know it's getting close to 10, so I just want to ask you one more question. Sure. With your upcoming projects, First Wives Club and Clueless, Ooh. any fun stories you can tell us? <laughs> Maybe specifically about Clueless, because I'm excited about that. <laughs> um, Clueless is still in the very early script stages, but um, First, First Wives Club, we actually shot in New York. That was a lot of fun. I relocated. I was there for seven months. Um, and it's a nod to the original movie in a lot of ways. If, if everyone saw the movie, then you'll see a lot of like hidden things in it. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Awesome. I love that. Okay, I want to open up the conversation to some questions. We'll take a few. You can just shout it out. Hi, um, I went to USC um, to fight on, and at first I want to say thank you so much for living your truth, and I had no idea that writers could be executive producers, that, if that was even a possibility. My question is about um, continuing diversity. I'm really passionate about that. 70s, there was black exploitation, 90s, we had the Wayans and Boomerang and all of that fun stuff, and now there seems to be a resurgence, and I hate the idea of being a trend. Right? How do you, how is this not a trend? And furthermore, I hate the idea of here's a few black movies, we're diverse. Mm -hmm. Where's mm -hmm. everything else for diversity? Mm -hmm. You know, so that's my question for how do we, how do we keep it going where I, I don't want to be a trend. You know, my life is not a trend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, that's something that a lot of writers and content creators grapple with every day. Are we in a trend? Is this going to all disappear in two years? Or is this an ongoing change? I don't have the answer to that. I hope that it's not. I really do. Um, but the, the cynical part of me sometimes worries that if you oversaturate a market, and sometimes people rush to put stuff out, and it's not necessarily the best thing to put out, but they're just putting it out anyway to capitalize on a trend, and then if it doesn't do well, they don't say, well, that movie isn't good, or that show wasn't executed well, they'll just say, well, we can't do a movie about X, Y, and Z, you know? And I think that's really damaging. Um, so I hope that we can be judged not by every single project that comes out and that people will just continue to support regardless. Um, not regardless of quality, you don't have to see every movie, mm -hmm. but I'm hoping that the, the buyers and the networks and everybody that um, really decide what gets put out into the marketplace doesn't just one day decide because of one bomb that we can't make this product anymore. Because I think that we've proven if you make a good thing, um, no matter who's in the cast, people will show up for it. So I'm hoping that we just get judged by the quality of the work. And that, that goes for everybody, not just black people, because there's a lot of niche um, content creators that I worry about as well. Yeah. Okay, next question. Um, <laughs> so every project varies, but usually, like I'll take a little for example, you and Girl Strip follow the same thing. You come up with a pitch, um, which includes the characters and the storylines and, and basically what happens from act one through the end. And the studio weighs in on it. Either, we'll assume they buy it. and. When they do, they have notes. So before you can go off the script, they have things that they want to alter with it. And then you do some type of outline or a treatment of that, and you kind of flesh out the ideas. And then you go to script on it. And then that's when the real headache begins. <laughs> and you're alone by yourself or in a coffee shop with a friend. And you're just making it work. And for me, I like to minimize the amount of issues that come up in a script 
So I'll outline and note card something to death before I even go to script, just because it's a lot easier when you can just move a card around than it is when you're 30 pages into something and you realize none of it works. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I try to do a lot of like pre-planning before I go to script. And then once the script is written, um, I like to send it to a friend that I trust before I send it to the producers. Because no matter what they say, they are judging you. And most people, most people who are not writers cannot read a rough draft of something and not judge you for it. Mm -hmm. They say they can, but they're lying to you. <laughs> so send it to someone else that you trust before you send it to a producer. And then when the producers get it, they have notes. So then you're doing a producer's pass. And then when they feel like it's ready to go into the studio, then the studio gets it. I hope that. Oh, no, that. Great okay. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one more. I'll go to the side back there. Hi, congratulations. You Hi. Brilliant. Yeah. And I'm also another Trojan kid. Okay. Okay, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so Little was different than Girls Trip. Um, with Little, I wrote, a, I think, two or three drafts of it. And then when Tina came on and Tina directed it, and we didn't write together. Um, Tina is also a writer. And so she had, she basically maintained a lot of the, the character stuff that I created, but she had a lot of different ideas. And the thing about directors is, they always come in bringing their own personal taste and, and their ideas to it. And so from there, um, Tina did you know her pass on the script as well. And so I would say what's on the screen is more closely resembling Tina's last drafts. Um, but then there's still obviously, because we share credit on it, there's still a lot of what I did um, as well. So it's kind of a, a merging of two different ideas, but um, I think the interesting thing about that, just to keep in mind as a writer, um, we're just the first step, you know? You think that you have a project that's, when it's good and, and people like it, when you show up to the theater, it's gonna be exactly that, but it goes through so many reincarnations, and um, a lot of what, you know, Tina did, um, which is a different, you know, than what I had done, not that it's, you know, good or bad, but some of it was different. And writers, sometimes when we go to theaters, we're actually like, oh, okay, that, they changed that, or this is different. And um, depending on what that relationship is and how closely you work together, you can see a script all the way through, or you might see that it's changed. And so it really just depends, but I do want to, you know, spell that out because if you think that um, whatever's on screen is exactly what the writer wrote, most often it's not. Mm -hmm. There's always changes. There's always something, to be honest, that they elevated the hell out of and you're like, oh, wow, they made that even funnier. And then there's some stuff where you're like, why did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> you just never know. Uh, but that's the truth. We don't have complete control over it either way. And any final thoughts or pieces of advice for you know, writers, producers in the industry? Um, I guess I would say do it yourself. I know that sounds weird, but um, I think I owe a large part of my career success to taking a lot of no's and just saying whatever, I'm just gonna go make it or I'm going to write it anyway. And a lot of times, it's hard to really even sell something or convince somebody of it until you shoot it or until you write it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Donald Glover, actually, with Atlanta, and I know this from talking to him and also talking to um, the people at FX that made Atlanta, they were so baffled by that pilot. They just didn't get it. And he said, you'll get it when I make it. Mm -hmm. And it was brilliant when it was shot and made, but it didn't necessarily translate. And that was what was happening with Awkward Black Girls. When we, when we tried to tell people what it was, they didn't get it. 
And sometimes you know in your gut that you're onto something, but people don't get it, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. Sometimes there are certain projects that are better in execution. And so if someone says no, I think sometimes you should just write it or make it and force people to see something that they didn't think was possible or good in it. So I don't necessarily think if, if someone says no to you that you're not onto something. You should keep doing it anyway. I love that. So moral of the story, make your own content and ask for what you want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you, guys. And thank you guys for joining us. Wonderful night. Drive safely. Thanks for coming out, guys.